As a creative entrepreneur, your time is literally your most valuable resource. From a business perspective, time is what you sell because your artistic products require time to create. From a personal perspective, all work and no play makes you a miserable, starving artist. And it's right there in the name of the podcast that we're saying no more to the myth of the starving artist. One thing is for sure, time is valuable. But we don't often think of time as a resource, something to use and manage to our advantage. Today, we're going to look into what it means to think of time as a resource and how that mindset can boost your creativity. Welcome to the Starving Artist No More podcast with me, your host, Jennifer Jill Araya. Starving Artist No More is a business coaching community dedicated to helping creative entrepreneurs cast off the starving artist and find thriving fulfillment from their businesses. If you are a creative entrepreneur who wants more from your creative business, if you want to build a thriving business that truly meets your needs and fulfills you holistically, personally, creatively, and financially, if you want to move beyond the harmful starving artist stereotype into a place of abundance, joy, and fulfillment in your creative artistic work, then you're in the right place. I'm so glad you're here. Hello, thriving artists, and welcome to episode 59 of the Starving Artist No More podcast. I'm so glad you're here with me today. In today's episode, we're going to talk about how we think about our time and how that impacts our creative businesses. And we're going to do that through a conversation with actor, narrator, director, and audio engineer, Jennifer Blom. Jen has been a good friend of mine for years, and she's in fact going to be a faculty member at the Thriving Narrators Retreat that's happening in Cincinnati this August. I'm thrilled to get to share this conversation with you. But Jen is more than just a friend and a colleague. She is actually the reason I'm hosting a retreat for audiobook narrators in just over a month. In March of 2023, Arturo and I were in New York City to participate in APAC, the Audio Publishers Association Conference, and to attend the Audio Awards Gala, which is kind of like the Oscars for audiobooks. After one of the events, Arturo and I headed out for a bite to eat with some of our friends. And during our conversation in the back corner of a little hole-in-the-wall New York restaurant, Jen asked me if I'd ever considered hosting a retreat or workshop for narrators. I had thought about it, I was already coaching individually and in online group workshop settings, and hosting some sort of event did sound like something I might want to do at some nebulous point in the future. But until Jen's question, it wasn't something I had seriously considered. But out of Jen's question, and the subsequent conversation with Gail Shallon and Neil Helligers, who were also present that evening, and who are also both going to be faculty members at the retreat— the Thriving Narrator's Retreat was born. I tell this story not just because I think it's a neat story, although it is. I share it to give you a glimpse of Jen's perceptiveness. She has the beautiful ability to see potential and possibility when others can't. I certainly didn't see the beautiful reality that could be created if I took a leap of faith and committed to hosting a retreat for audiobook narrators but Jen did. And I think that's part of what has made her so successful in her creative career. Jen never takes the status quo as an answer. If she sees something that could be better, or if she sees something that's not working the way it should, or if she sees a beautiful possibility that could exist, she goes after it. She works to find a better way. In the conversation Jen and I shared, and that you'll get to listen in on in just a moment, she explained a bit about how she views time. Our time is precious to us as creative entrepreneurs. It is immensely valuable. 
And as a result, we can treat it the same way we treat any other precious resource that we have. Just like we are careful and deliberate with our financial resources, we can be careful and deliberate with our time resources. We can take steps that will allow that resource to last. Viewing our time as a precious resource involves making small tweaks that will help us be more efficient. We can all take small steps so that the non-creative parts of our work life are as efficient as possible, giving us the most time possible for our joyful creative endeavors. Jen has lots of examples in our conversation about how she automates tasks in her non-creative work time so that those tasks take less time and are less likely to pull her focus away from her creative work. But in addition to those small, cumulative efficiency steps, the result of a mindset that views time as a resource will also include an attitude of care and intention in what we choose to do and when. It includes a willingness to try out a new skill or a new project or a new idea that has a possibility to help us grow, even if we're not sure whether or not it will help. But if that possibility is there, we'll give it a try just to see how it changes things. Viewing time as a precious resource helps you to say yes to what your body needs on any given day so that you're able to be your very best. It includes saying yes to what you feel you can do in that specific moment and valuing each moment in time for all it's worth. Viewing time as a resource is taking a step toward positive change, even if that step is scary. It's a willingness to give it a try. Let's take a listen to the delightful conversation I was lucky enough to have with Jen Blom. I am so excited today that we have with us narrator, director, and audiobook engineer extraordinaire, Jennifer Blum. Jen, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I am excited to have you. So let's dive right on in. You work, as I already mentioned in the intro, you work as an audiobook narrator an audiobook director, and an audiobook engineer. And it is entirely possible that you've got some other areas of work that I don't even know about. So I would love to know what led you into all of those various roles within the audiobook industry. Um, So I guess it goes back to the power of yes. There was, well, you know, books about this and a whole like movement, but basically just, yeah, I, I don't know what I don't know, but I also am very up to learning things and understanding my whole industry completely. So when um, it was like December one year and very close to Christmas and someone was like, oh, we have a last minute need for an engineer to edit this. And um, so they need to know Reaper. I'm like, well, I've only edited myself, but I guess it's the same thing. I'm like, sure, I have the time. Why don't I help out? And that led to saying yes to other things, to um, now, you know, working at Macmillan as a record engineer, director, and those type of things. But it all started from that initial, let's not be scared about this. Let's just say, yeah, I have a skill set and let's use it in this new uh, way that I hadn't thought about prior. So tell me a little bit more about this, this power of yes. I know that there is a book and I will link it in the show notes so people can refer to it, but I've not actually read it. So for someone who's not familiar with this framework, tell me how you've used this in your creative career. Um, it's, it's basically the simplest way to break it down. Um, Cliff Notes version is just saying yes when an opportunity presents itself in uh, over time, you learn to do it in a way that doesn't hurt you as far as putting too much on your plate. But ultimately, it is don't be afraid of saying yes. Most people that learn a new skill just said yes, you know, more times than someone who has not learned that skill. Because um, I always quote um, Meet the Robinsons, uh, and this is a quote from other things, but it's like, from failure, you learn from success, not so much. Sure. So um, I really subscribe to that, to saying yes and being OK if I'm not excellent the first time. But I also make sure I don't make the same mistake twice by just learning from each little mistake that I make along the way. 
Oh, that is a really good life concept and career concept and creative concept. I actually have a podcast episode that the title is The Price of Success is Failure. The point being that if you don't fail occasionally, then you'll never learn enough to eventually succeed. Yeah, and there's there's schools of thought that are like, you have to fail a lot, right? Most successful people, like if you look at, um, you know, people, there was a quote actually by Roger Federer that I just shared with a group, friend group uh, today, but it was, I have won about 80% of my matches. I have lost about 54% of the points I've played. So like that's tennis, uh, like, uh, you know, calculations for you, but the whole point still stands. Like he failed almost as many times as he succeeded as far as point by point. But as far as grand overlooking, you know, uh, big picture, he looks like a huge success. But there's all of those small moments and points of failure along the way that he learned and adapted and grew from. Oh, wow. That's a really interesting concept and very much points out winning the war and not worrying about winning the battles. Right. 100 percent. Now, you referenced maybe the downside of saying yes so often, which is that you then can possibly have way too much on your plate. So because you do work in so many different areas of audiobooks, I have to imagine that most of the time you have a lot going on. So can you tell us how you decide what you're going to say yes to? Which projects come your way are you going to say, that's right for me, but that isn't? What criteria do you use? So I, I I will say I have not always been great at it. And I think that is part of the journey of uh, the saying yes and the failure and all of that combined because you learn more about yourself and what each one of those yeses cost. And then you can, from there, decide, you know, hey, which which yeses are worth it to me? I have found the ones that take the most time are sometimes the ones that I say no to unless it's creatively fulfilling. So uh, what I mean by that is if I am sitting in a booth and doing one thing versus the other, like let's say narration versus record engineering um, and not necessarily directing, but just record engineering, sometimes that takes on my list a little bit of a back burner to the things where I feel creatively fulfilled. And that the reason for that is when I'm creatively fulfilled, it also recharges me, whereas um, you know, just sitting there and being uh, drained from both my creative perspective and also my just body getting tired, that just doesn't feel at the end of the day like I've done anything for myself. Because I'm like, money's money. And we all love money. But <laughs> we all need it. Um, we <laughs> it do need it. <laughs> um, but there is that point where it's like, but what am I willing to sacrifice? Just like, what am I willing to sacrifice for the yeses? What am I willing to sacrifice for the money? Um, and once, once I hit the threshold of like, I've made enough to, you know, pay my bills, to do this, to do that, then it's very much shifted from, okay, I have to say yes, just for the money to I'm saying yes, that cause I have the money. Cause I've already said yes to things that I necessarily may not have, um, had I not needed the money, but like now I'm saying yes, only for my creative, uh, pursuits, the multi hyphenate gives me the creative freedom to, and the, um, sometimes I need technical stimulation. So like there's a, there's a balancing act. It's like, sure. okay, which part of me needs more, uh, filling up at this point? And then I kind of use that as a guiding post as well. Yeah. You want to have that variety in what you're doing so that you're doing something different every day. Why else be involved in so many facets of right. the industry? I'm a multi-hyphenate, but I only use the one hyphen. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that is discussing sort of the project management, deciding what to say yes to and what to say no to. And again, I've got another podcast about that, the working in your creative and financial sweet spot. And I'll link that one in the show notes too. But moving just from the project management side to actually the task management side, because again, I know that you've got a lot on your plate. So when you have all these different tasks, do you have any systems or what strategies do you use to figure out what you're going to do on any given workday? 
So my system is to not get overwhelmed uh, by thinking about too big of a chunk of my time. Mm -hmm. Um, So usually it is just, what do I need to accomplish today? What is my must-dos? What is my nice-to-have? Like, very much like you would use a budget for your finances is my time, right? So like, Mm -hmm. in the morning, I'm like, okay, so I have a list of things that need to be done this week. That's all I focus on. I don't think about next week or next month or whatever, because that's too overwhelming. Um, And sometimes my brain can't even handle all the stuff I have to do this week. So then I'm like, okay, (laughs) what do I have to do today? Um, Not feeling well. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, you know what's coming up. It's not like I have forgotten it completely. But as long as I do the day the way I need to do the day, then everything else will um, fall into place. I'm a a big proponent of the domino effect. Uh, They talk about it in the one thing. Um, What's the one thing I can do today that'll um, reach my goals, you know, this week, this month, this year is the TLDR version, but the book's really great. Read it. I'll link Um, show notes. There's going to be lots of links in in the show notes for this one. (laughs) Um, But uh, that specific concept is really enlightening because uh, every time I feel overwhelmed come creep in, it's like, okay, I get that today feels overwhelming. What's the thing I can do in the next week, you know, or sorry, the next minute or the next 10 minutes or whatever to, uh, to get it done. Sure. So that small step taking the next right thing that you can do. Right. Um, and I also, um, as far as systems that I put in place, I'm a huge proponent of the snooze function on email. I love snoozing it until a specific time or the next morning. I find it less intrusive than some of those, like there's this do app that I do like for some things, but Uh, Basically, it just keeps alerting you every minute until you've completed a task. And I use that for some things. (laughs) For some things. (laughs) And like you can set how like every five minutes or whatever. But um, that is is, is some things. It needs to annoy me enough that I do it. Like uh, this is probably too whatever. I'll I'll admit it. I am bad at invoicing. (laughs) So sometimes I need that pester to be like, yo, you did this work like a month ago. And unless you decide to, I don't know, mm, like charge them for it, they're never going to pay you. Okay. Uh, That said. Invoicing is kind of important. Yeah. (laughs) Which is why I'm always like, I need to hire an assistant just to be like, here's all the annoying stuff I do not like to do, which Uh, is again, part of my efficiency thing like that. What do I need to do versus what can I outsource, which I know you've talked about before um, versus what um, like, like what has to be me? What doesn't have to be me? um, What can be automated, et cetera. They go on lists. And when I have downtime, if I ever have downtime, I work on the things that I can automate because I have a little bit of a background in uh, programming um, and if I can't find a tool or a way to write it out, then I see like, okay, do I just have to suck it up or do I want to spend the money? Um, and that's always that trade off, right? What can I throw at this money or my time? And what am I willing to throw at it at this point based on how much money I have coming in versus how much time I currently have available? And uh, it's always that kind of a, a through line. Yeah, figuring out that calculus. And again, we're just hitting like all of these podcast topics I've talked about in the past. There's an outsourcing podcast episode I've done. So I'll link that one in the show notes as well. (laughs) Basically, this is just a summary of all the things that you should put in your show notes. (laughs) All of my episodes have covered all of these topics. Thanks, well, Jen. not quite all of them. And I, <laughs> I definitely am enjoying your spin on them, Jen. So you mentioned efficiency just a moment ago. And talking about some efficiency tips is something that you're going to be presenting on at the Thriving Narrators Retreat, where you're going to be a fa- faculty member. And I'm thrilled to have you there. And I'm I very excited. Have, can you give us a couple sneak peeks of some of those efficiency ideas that you've got to share? Sure. Um So it's a very um, not one size fits all approach, but it's finding those um, and I'll have plenty of suggestions, but uh, with the caveat that everything will be based on what will make you thrive. So um, for me, for example, uh, hotkeys in my DAW, huge. Mm. If you think about all the little buttons you push to punch in every time, like, oh, I have to grab my mouse. I have to move the cursor, I have to then press the undo because I want to get rid of this. And then I have to click, you know, here and then I have to press record. And you've done six to 10 steps. Like I've watched people do it when I've uh, remote in to like help them with something. And I'm like, 
if you think about it for like one time, that's not a big deal, six to seven steps. But when you think about the fact that we punch in, let's say a thousand times in a book, right? That is a thousand times 10 seconds. Don't make me do math. But those are minutes. <laughs> those are whole minutes of your, your time that add up. And so if you just have one keystroke, which takes that 10 second thing and makes it one second or less, that's a lot of time savings. Um, and even if you're not good at math, I think you can math that enough in your head to be like, oh, one is smaller than 10. <laughs> that feels like a good investment of time. Um, and over time, you figure out what things those are, like custom search engines um, in Google Chrome, where you can just type in like, uh, for me, I type in M-E-R and then uh, tab or space and then type in the word I'm looking for. And it immediately brings up Merriam-Webster and the um, pronunciation, which, yeah, I know I can type in Miriam. It'll be on the list. I can click on it. I can then type it in or I can keep it open. But if I have that muscle memory of being able to just type in M-E-R space and the name or word or paste it in if I've copied it, that saves time. Again, um, the copying and pasting too. People uh, sometimes, you know, don't realize how much that can save. So maybe it's useful to be reading off of a monitor as opposed to your iPad because then they are all connected so you can quickly copy and paste from the same script that you're reading on to where you're going to be looking stuff up. Things like that. Um, so it's the idea of looking at the things that you do frequently and figuring out how can technology or anything help me automate this process so that it is one step, maybe two steps rather than 10, 15 steps. 100%. And that might be the tools too, right? Like, so um, I watched uh, during the pandemic, everyone was kind of sharing their process, like on Discord or whatever. And Andy Arndt was reading on there once and she used a, um, like a magic tablet thingy in her booth. Magic trackpad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, trackpad. That's the name. I'm just going to call it <laughs> magic. That is definitely the name they should have gone with. Magic trackpad. Um, oh, is it not called a magic trackpad? I thought it it, it, it definitely is. I am saying what I just <laughs> called it was uh, so much cooler and it just flew off the tongue. Anyway, point being that specific thing means that it doesn't make noise when I'm scrolling. It doesn't make noise because uh, you can turn off any click sounds, right? So I can just tap where I need to and still go. And it can let me scroll uh, easily through my script if I'm reading off of my screen again, because that's what I've decided to do. Um, the other thing is there's things called a uh, better touch tool, which means I can put certain gestures on this tablet that will do different things on my computer. Um, little things like that. And it sounds, sounds super technical, right? Like it it sounds like that. But uh, arguably, even though tech is involved, it's just a matter of thinking through the steps you take every day and how you can make it more efficient for yourself. Once any of these solutions are put into place, the tech stuff goes away. You're like, oh, okay, yeah, I put in place this really tech heavy thing and it was so hard to implement. Oh yeah, but now it just works, right? Like <laughs> taking the minute or two to set up uh, in Reaper, they do custom actions. It's basically a playlist of all those little steps I was telling you about. Once you have that set and it's attached to one little key press, you don't think about what the, that custom action does. It's like if you you know make a recipe, right? Once it's cooked and you're eating it, hmm. yeah, you know you cooked it, but like your brain's not usually going through, oh yeah, I remember cooking this. First, I put the pan on the stove. Then I turned on the heat. Like, you don't think about all of that, like, little minuscule detail, probably. I'm not saying, like, some people don't get enjoyment from that, like, or uh, do think through it like that. But most of the time, once it's on your plate and you're eating it, you have moved on to this next thing that you're doing. So muscle memory will just kick in and you won't even think about all of that additional amazing time saving. Absolutely. I like that recipe analogy because... What we're wanting for these sorts of tasks, I mean, there are plenty of things where the process matters, yeah. but for things where what you're looking for is that result or that outcome and there are processes that you have to do over and over and over again, anything that you can do to condense that recipe into 
here it is, it's already on the plate and it's done, is going to save you time and actually going to give you time back in your creative process. Because I don't know about you, but moving my mouse and getting it where it needs to be for me to be able to record again is not part of the creative action of the worst. (laughs) (laughs) Also, uh, it's interesting because those are those little sticky points, right? People are like, I don't know how to stay in the zone, focused and get through the flow state, right? Like, And because you have all those little micro annoyances that your body feels that you don't necessarily, it's switching you out of the creative space into the technical space. I say, you can't see me, but I'm using quotes because it's not really a technical space because like you're just moving, you're doing meaningless task is basically what it becomes, right? Because once you know how your DAW works, it is just you moving stuff around, but you know exactly, you know, that you're just doing meaningless stuff. Point being, you want to remove all of those little spots of friction so that it feels so seamless when you punch in or you do this, that, or the other, that you can stay in the flow. Because I like to use sports psychology a bunch when I'm talking about this stuff. Not that I'm a sports psychologist, but when I hear sports people talk about it, specifically in tennis, because it's uh, uniquely uh, well-suited to what we do because we're alone in a booth usually and we have to find it within ourselves to find... Um, you know, what will help us. But in that sense, you have a lot of things that uh, kind of play into it. Like, yeah, they're not thinking about, oh, I have to go get the ball from the ball kid. And then I have to like, you know, walk to the line. All of that is part of it, but it's so second nature that at that point, they're just internalizing what comes next, the creative part of serving that ball and then getting ready for the return. And they're able to use that time to creatively adjust as opposed to being distracted by the meaningless part of their job. Absolutely. Oh, such good ideas. Thank you. Now, you have been talking just a little bit just now about your creative process, and I'd like to know more. I mean, what routines and habits do you use in your workday so that you're your creative best? Uh, yeah. So um, I listen to my body uh, in the way that uh, some days... Uh, I need more of a warm up. Some sometimes I feel like in our in our industry we get so used to, okay, I have to do exactly the same type of approach to my day to start it with the same fervor or whatever. Sometimes your body doesn't need that. Some days your body's super, like your throat's super tired and like you're like, okay, I need a full vocal warm up. And some days you roll out of bed and your like voice somehow just stayed warm overnight and you're just like, <laughs> ah, I can talk and it's perfect. Um, I don't know what it is. I love those mornings though, but uh, some days like I'm like, I very much sound like I chain smoked overnight and I'm like, I'm not even a smoker. How is this possible? <laughs> anyway, so I do full work, vocal warmups or, um, you know, movement or those type of things. So I spend a little bit of my time getting prepared, whatever that means. For example, some days my brain isn't ready. Like I can't, even though I want to creatively be in in charge of it, sometimes it's hard to get started reading. Uh, It's the weirdest thing because that's what we do for a living. But I read this, uh, it wasn't for what we do, but it was for how to get in the flow state for reading faster. Um, It was like a Medium article. Um, And it was talking about what people like have to read like huge amounts of text for their work. But uh, which we do, but like they meant it more in research. Anyway, they're like, read the most boring thing you can find for 10 minutes before you read the thing that you have to read to focus in on. So I have this book um, series, How Things Work, I think is what it's called. But it's just this like three or four like books that are in this series. And like they each have a page of how different things work, like How does AC work? How do temperature gauges work? Um, And I have it because someone mentioned it when I was a junior software engineer and they're like, well, you need to think through problems and how things work to be able to find creative solutions. But so I, I started doing this a while back when I was struggling to get into the material. I would read one of those pages and like learn something, which I love. My brain's like, oh yeah, I learned something today. But also the writing is so dry that I'm like, 
okay, anything that I read is going to like feel like a Michael Bay movie. You know, like it's going to be <laughs> so enjoyable because I just read the driest stuff ever with huge words I don't really understand um, and as street smart as uh, I am and some technical knowledge, I am not a scientist, nor do I play one in most of my books. Although if you find my voice fitting for one, please do cast me. I'll look up the words. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> but that that's kind of how I, I get into it. A lot of it is also, um, I have a lot of improv background. So as far as when I'm in the moment, uh, that helps guide me through like prep is is great, but I I love the organic feel of a scene. So like even if I've prepped it one way, like some people have like an emotional journey that are going to take you through. I just I don't subscribe to planning it out like that. For me, it doesn't work for other people. I've seen it work magnificently. And I'm like, oh, I wish it was them. But for me, it's like, yeah, but I just delivered that line slightly different, which means to be the actor that I am, I must deliver the line back slightly different than I originally conceived. Sure. Yeah, I see that as the pantser versus plotter difference that writers talk about so much. Yeah. I would definitely be a plotter and you would definitely be a pantser. <laughs> 100%. And a lot of my friends are definitely, uh, you know, plotters. And I'm just like, oh, but we could just do it by the seat of our pants. Mm -hmm. That's great. It, whatever works uh, for the end result, uh, the best is good. Sure, sure. Um, the through line of my our, our conversation today is basically like, what feels good to you? Um, and that's usually the right choice. I love that you are so conscious of listening to what your body is telling you you need on a specific day, which may be different from day to day. And also what your brain and your creative juices are telling you that you need on a specific day, which again might be different from day to day. I mean, I'm sure there are days that you don't have to read the how things work in order to be ready to dive into the audiobook that you're working yeah. on. Whereas other days you just need that dry stuff so that the audiobook feels really exciting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, do, I, I think it's also just the fact that I'm like, I, I'm having a hard time focusing my brain onto something that doesn't feel intellectually stimulating. And I think that also plays into it. Uh, just like your circadian rhythm during a day will sometimes have a part of your day that is more constructive for the work you're trying to do versus, um, you know, not that is your, your body usually wants that too, right? Sometimes it's like, okay, I want to just sit here and write for like an hour. Can I just do that? And like, honestly, the answer I usually give myself is yes. Because the book will still get done. The like uh, all those little multi hyphenates that I have, the reason it works is because I move things around very fluidly. Like I don't get stuck in a well, I said I was going to sit here for three hours and record this book. If my body's not being productive doing that, then I will course correct, switch it up and then revisit it later on. I'm very fluid when it comes to that and be like, OK, well, I tried and this is not that moment um, I also, something I will talk about is uh, Pomodoro and my obsession with uh, that method of work. You are and the one who actually introduced me to the Pomodoro method years and years ago. And I don't use it all the time, but it is very helpful on those days when I am just not able to focus. So thank it's, you. You're very welcome. Um, I wish I could take credit for it, but uh, I I love introducing people to it that don't know about it. But that my relationship with that is also very fluid. Some days I'm like, I can't even sit still for five minutes. This is part of I'm recovering from burnout. So it mm. yeah, that was another reason I really became interested in um, listening to my body. But sure. the um, the power of the Pomodoro is like, if I can't sit here for five minutes, my fight or flight is, you know, all over the place because my cortisol level is spiked. I can sit here for five I can plan it out and I can see how my body feels after that. Once it has calmed into this routine, do I feel good enough for me to continue on? And the answer is usually yes. Sometimes uh, they have this thing called the two minute rule. I don't know. They they, they call rule everything rules. <laughs> but like basically you set a two minute timer. You sit down to do the task. When the two minute timer is up, you make a conscious decision like, hey, how does my body feel? Oh, it feels good. Okay. Let me start another two minute timer. And then until you like are like, oh no, I feel great. And this two minute timer is interrupting my flow. And you get mad at the two minute timer for trying to stop you from working. You don't set the two, two minute timer again. And you just work until you don't want to anymore. But like, that's another way to kind of 
give yourself the freedom to understand what your body is trying to tell you. Sure. A two minute timer is like nothing. Like I can do most things for two minutes. I'm seeing a through line in our conversation or hearing a through line in our conversation of small steps mm -hmm. that if something is feeling too big and can be automated and reduced to a small step, then reduce it to a small step. And if something is feeling too big because there's just too much of it, pick one tiny spot and start there. And if yeah. something is feeling too big and is going to take too long, don't try to do all of it. Just do two minutes or five yeah. minutes and just always breaking it down, breaking it down. Yeah, it's like those penny jars of like productivity, right? Like, you know, like the penny jar where you just like throw in a penny because you're saving up for a big like adventure. Sure. That's what you're doing when you are giving small amounts of time to something. It goes back to, OK, but that's two minutes I don't have to do later. Even if that's all I do today, I can be like, well, I got two minutes done. And like it still is good for your nervous system because you're like, but I got something done. I didn't just like let it defeat me. Like I did sit down and I gave it a valiant effort. My body wasn't here to play today, but I still did the thing. And that is enough on a lot of a lot of days every day. That is enough. You showed up, whatever you got done, it's enough. Absolutely. Ah. Oh. Words to live by, for sure. <laughs> well, we are, believe it or not, on to our final question, which is something that I ask most people that I've interviewed for this particular podcast. And you've already shared some of the tools and resources and things that you use. But I would love to know, is there one tip or tool or resource that you use and you love and it makes you awesome at the work that you do that we've not talked about yet today? Oof, let's see. I like that I've automated my refrigerator to turn off when I'm in record focus mode. Oh, my gosh. No, as a, as a narrator, I mean, the, the creatives who do not work in the audiobook industry who are listening to this might be like, what the are what are you talking about? <laughs> However, <Okay. laughs> I mean, you can explain it, but that is brilliant. <laughs> um, so, OK, so this works even if you don't work in the audiobook field. This works for a lot of things. Like some people are like, oh, I wish people would know when I was recording or doing this or that. You can attach a smart uh, plug to any device, right? And like, as long as that thing, like a lamp, knows that it's on usually, but unless it, the power plug tells it it's getting power, it won't be on until that happens. So effectively, and then you can attach that to this is very geeky, but you can attach it to your focus mode on your phone or on your Mac and they can all talk to each other. So basically, once I'm in record mode, it changes my screen to red. So I know like I'm actually in record mode. So for the next hour I'm recording, but um, it turns off the power to my fridge because my fridge is in the same like open floor plan uh, in my apartment. So like I've noticed it just to be picked up by your microphone. Yeah. So it, it raises my noise floor a little bit. It's workable, manageable, whatever, but I don't like it as the perfectionist. I say perfectionist. I'm not a perfectionist, but like as the like sound snob that I am, that sounds better than perfectionist. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't I want that noise. The thing. Thing. <laughs> sound snob sounds less pretentious somehow. I don't know. Um, but also it's achievable. You can, in fact, be a sound snob. You may not be a perfectionist. Um, <laughs> But uh, so that is a cool thing that I found works for me because I don't have to like pull my fridge out, unplug it, you know, or whatever, or find a power button that usually doesn't exist on a um, fridge. But like that was something I was like, OK, but I don't need to think about it. And I don't have to. I used to just go into the app on my phone and turn it off manually. But then I'm like, but if I'm in the focus mode where like it only allows like a certain app to like annoy me and everything else will be quiet for the next hour. It's all attached to the same fundamental um, sure. button push. Like I'm like, okay, I'm in focus mode. I know I am because I have a visual reminder. And also it takes care of the fridge noise. I don't have to worry about it clicking on in the middle of my recording moment. That is beautiful. And, and again, that kind of goes back to what you were saying at the beginning, that if you've got something that you do all the time that takes multiple steps, figure out how to make it one step, maybe two. Make yeah. this small for yourself. Make it a small step. Yeah, um, a small incremental step. Things that like and some people keep themselves in focus mode like the whole day. So they never see their email notifications until the hour 
that they want to see the email notifications. You can do that on your phone. You don't have to be available at all times for people. So I guess if I was going to TLDR efficiently allow yourself to be everything that you can be in this moment and nothing more. Again, words to live live by, Jen. Thank you so much. This has been a delightful conversation with lots of amazing nuggets. And I know I'm going to be thinking about some of these things for a while. Figuring out what I, what I can automate, how I can shrink this down into easier steps for myself. Easy now. It can get very, like, <laughs> very exciting. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, wait, I haven't actually done anything besides make myself super efficient today. Right. So. But once I make things efficient, then they work and I never have to worry about it again. This is you a good permission to spend a whole day on it but then tomorrow <laughs> back to work or at least yeah. on monday because yeah, you know, at least on monday when we're recording, recording. this it's friday <laughs> exactly yeah tomorrow i will not be working because it's weekend <laughs> <laughs> well it was a, such a pleasure thanks so much for having me and i am excited to have you for the thriving narrators retreat in august it's going to be great it's going to be amazing Thank you so much for being with me today for this episode of the Starving Artist No More podcast. I truly value your time, and I will never take it for granted that you spend some of that time with me listening to this podcast. And I hope you, too, value your time. A huge thank you to Jennifer Blom for joining me for this episode. Jen will be a faculty member at the upcoming Thriving Narrators Retreat in Cincinnati, which is taking place August 22nd through 25th, 2024. If you'd like more information about that event, you can find all the details on my website, starvingartistnomore.com. As of early July 2024, when this episode is being published, registration is still open for the retreat, and I anticipate that we'll be able to accept new attendees through the end of July. I'd love to have you join us. A huge thank you also goes out to my husband, Arturo Araya, who is the audio engineer extraordinaire for every episode of this podcast. When a potential new change is scary to you, don't let that initial fear reaction be your last answer. When Jen suggested that I host a retreat for narrators, my first response was to be scared. But a mindset that views our time as precious is also a mindset that encourages us to do the most good in the time we have. We can tell ourselves that even though the thing might be scary, that thing still might be worth doing, and we can still give it a try. Say yes to what your body needs. Say yes to what you're capable of. Value your time and use it well. I can't wait to see what you create. <laughs>